fact, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up. We are going to be in a couple of different passages, but I think the place that would be good to park yourself at is the book of 2 Kings. We're going we're gonna to cover this story of Elisha, who was a prophet of God, and he had this experience where the supernatural, the spiritual things kind of, you know, made their awareness to the people that were there with Elisha, him and his servant. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. It's different than natural warfare. Spiritual warfare is around us where you, you might be able to escape natural warfare. We know what is going on in the Middle East. And so a lot of us, we haven't seen like warfare like that. Uh, you know, those of you that are veterans, you, I'm sure you've seen it plenty. But there's a war that is here with us, among us, and a lot of us are not aware of it. And when I talk about this, some of you that are newer to church and maybe you're just now following Jesus in your life, this kind of a conversation may be a little different for you. But let me just tell you, for those of you that have been a part of church culture for a while, I believe the subject of spiritual warfare is the least talked about subject in the modern church, but I believe it is the most important subject that we need to know about. I really do. And so as I was praying about what message that I wanted to bring to you guys today, the Holy Spirit just kept speaking to me about talking to you about this. And perhaps the reason why I'm being inspired to talk to you guys about this is some of you are dealing with spirits and some of the issues going on with your life, but you haven't identified it as a spiritual battle. Maybe you've just dismissed it as relational conflict or maybe health issues. And could there be more going on in those situations than maybe you've given credit for? So I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into this talk today that I've just simply entitled The Invisible War. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much again, God, for this beautiful, blended family that you've brought together, God. So many brothers and sisters I haven't even met that have been attending here since I've left. And God, I pray that as we gather today in your name, Lord, that you would have fun with us, speak to us. I pray, God, that you would give us the ears to hear and the hearts to receive everything you want to deposit into our life this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Okay, so let me start with reading the scripture. If you're taking notes, write this scripture down. First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Now, they're going to put it up on the screen. And, and this is a... a kind of a paraphrased translation of scripture, the Passion Translation. I just like how they worded this scripture. It says, be well balanced and always alert. Say with me, always alert. Because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. Take a decisive stand against him and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. Is that a strong scripture? But it says here, it says, be always alert. And I don't know how many of you maybe have ever been in a gathering like this and you were just overwhelmed with being tired. Confession time. How many of you have ever fallen asleep in church? Don't lie, you're in God's house, all right? You fall asleep, all right. You know, you don't want to and you feel bad but believe me, sometimes when I'm preaching, I, I see you fighting it. I see this. It's like you're rocking out to some 1990s punk band. It's like, that, I get it. I understand. We, get, we can get so overwhelmed and, and exhausted that, that when we come to church, we haven't been like still all week and now we're sitting in this chair and it's comfy and we kind of go to sleep. How many of you have ever been caught sleeping while you were at school, like in a class. Okay, this is, a, this, is, this is fun. How many have ever been so asleep in the middle of class that you started drooling? Ah, okay, all right. You're, you're my people, all right. So sometimes you just get overwhelmed and, and you're exhausted, you'll fall asleep in class. 
The, the moment you really don't want to fall asleep, though, is while you're driving. Now, I was diagnosed years ago with a form of narcolepsy. And they said that, that I have this thing in me that I can go from like being wide awake to fast asleep like a light switch. That's, that's how the doctor kind of diagnosed me, like a light switch. I can, I can just be in conversation with you, and next thing you look back at me, and I'm just out. You know, and, and I had this problem ever since I, I was a little boy. And sometimes I would take these long trips and I mean, I would feel my body trying to go to sleep. And I'm like, you can't go to sleep, body. Like I'm driving this vehicle at 70 miles an hour. This is not a good moment to fall asleep. So, you know, the windows go down, the 80s music go up, and I'm like singing you know, uh, you know, oh, oh leaning on a breath, like slapping my face, like, Jim, do not fall asleep. Th this is the imagery that Peter is trying to get us to see when it comes to this idea of the warfare that is happening against your life. He's like, don't fall asleep. There's too much writing on your life for you to fall asleep to this very, very important part of your existence. And that is this cosmic war between good and evil, between light and darkness that is going on. Now, you don't need a pastor to tell you this. I mean, you turn across the news and you will be just blown away right there, just going, how could this atrocity happen? How could somebody commit such an evil act? And I will tell you, there are spirits propagating the evil actions of other people that we have unfortunately witnessed. I'm convinced, regardless of how you feel about the Middle East conflict, what this Hamas group did to those in Israel is evil and demonic at a level we haven't seen in a long time. The spiritual war around us is real, my friend, and it's time that we wake up to it. Now, in, in the academia, in intellectual circles, they'll be like, oh, you ancient believers, like nobody believes in that. That is, that is so ancient, you know, mythological belief. And a lot of times people in academia will dismiss this kind of stuff because you, you can't really like prove it, right? You can't like go in and, and look at stuff, even though it's interesting that, you know, if you watch documentaries, there's all kinds of documentaries on the paranormal right now. It seems like sometimes I think the world is more in touch with the spiritual than the church is, which is a whole different sermon. But you, you get these ideas of like, maybe there's something going on there, but I, I was listening on, on the way here. I, I love Sunny 106.5 in Vegas. And, and I love Delilah at night. Okay, so have you, have you heard her? Okay, so I mean, I grew up listening to Delilah, but you guys have her in Vegas. So I was listening to some Christmas jams last night in, in, and just, uh, just driving around Vegas with all these memories in my mind. But I started thinking about this phenomenon. Like, isn't it weird that we can go into our car and listen to music, all right? We get it like when we plug our iPhones in or whatever and we're listening to Spotify or, or our iTunes music playlist. But this radio frequency, like there's a station somewhere and they're broadcasting this, this song. And the song is traveling through these radio frequencies and these radio waves, and it's landing on some kind of antenna on our car, and it's, and it's being broadcast through our speakers. Now, trying to explain that, because you can't see radio waves, you can't see these frequencies that are in the air, but they're there, even though you can't see them. And this is kind of the... the idea, the imagery I want to create for you that just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Amplified. It says, you were following the ways of this world that is influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit who is now at work and the disobedient, that is the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. 
So there's a propagator behind the scenes that we cannot see. He's the principality of the air. He, he's got his own radio frequency, and he's getting a hold of people, and he's influencing people to do horrific things, and it's, it's real. It's as real as we are in this room right now in this moment. So I, I'll never forget first year of ministry, okay? Uh, Pastor Ron Vietti is my father-in-law. I don't know if some of you knew that or not, but I was raised up under his ministry and the first year that I was on his team as a pastor, I had somebody call into the church and they said they needed prayer. They were trying to escape this group of people. And so I started praying for this girl. And every time I would say, in Jesus' name, this girl started growling at me in this deep, horrific growl that I've never experienced in my life. And I was like, whoa, because I had heard the stories, right? I know in the Gospels there's demonized people. And, and, and you know, my father-in-law had told me all these stories. And I remember, like, you know, putting her on hold and telling my buddy that was in the cubicle next to me going, bro, we got a live one on the phone right now. I was so excited. And so I, I got on the phone and I just kept praying for her. And then I, I negotiated a deal where we were going to meet at a park and we were going to pray and we were going to cast this demon out of this girl, just like Jesus did. I mean, it was, was going to be epic. Well, my father-in-law gets involved and we all three go and we pray for this girl and she gets delivered of whatever this, this, thing was this entity and if she was faking it she deserves an oscar i mean it was so real her face even distorted i mean the maybe not as crazy as like the exorcist movie but it was pretty close her head didn't spin around and you know like that but it was pretty close you guys it was pretty crazy and and i know for a lot of us that have followed jesus for a while like theoretically we know that demons exist but I, I don't think we really kind of enter into each of our daily lives just thinking about this. We, we just kind of fall asleep to it because we can't see it. And, and I want you to know, when you have an encounter like I had, the theoretical becomes very real very quickly. And because of you know me being a pastor for the first year and that happening, it revolutionized how I looked at the Bible, how I looked at people. And I became very much aware of this. Now, there is a phenomenon, there is a trend right now within church culture of deliverance ministry. A movie was released last year. Uh, I, I did have the opportunity to see it. And I, I don't know if, if I'm ascribing to that type of theology where I'm not, I, I'm not blaming every bad decision on some kind of a demon. The demon made me do it. Uh, you know, sometimes the bad things happen in our life, not because of a demon, but because of a dumb decision on our part. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Don't, don't give the devil credit for a dumb decision that you actually made. You know, he's over there going, I don't need to mess with them. They're, they're doing enough damage on their own. But you, you, just, you have to understand, but there's, there's dark principalities, but there's also light principalities. We call these angels. Now, we know that there are demonic entities according to scripture. We know that there are angelic entities according to scripture. I mean, angels are throughout the Bible from the very beginning to the very ending. Genesis to Revelation, angels are having appearances to God's people throughout the entire book. Check this out in Hebrews chapter 13, verse two. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers for by so doing some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it have you ever had an encounter with somebody a stranger maybe they helped you maybe something kind of weird was there like you just happened to need something they were there and then you go to look for them and then they're like they disappeared now, I get stories because I'm a pastor. I get these like stories that people will forward to me uh, from different, you know, uh, TikToks or uh, Instagram reels or Facebook posts. And, and, and I, I am blown away on how many encounters people have had with kind of some unexplainable help that they've had for their life. Now, angels, by definition, are messenger spirits sent from God to help us. That, that's what an angel is. And so I'm convinced 
in the 35 years that I've been really connected, following Jesus wholeheartedly, being a pastor, I have probably a dozen stories. I can't prove that I was hosting an angel or being hospitable to an angel, but you guys, there's unexplainable stuff that happened. One time, my father-in-law and I were at a conference, and we went downtown L.A., and we had some uh, dinner, and this lady was there asking us if we would buy her some dinner, and we said, no problem, and we brought her in, and you know, we just thought we were treating her to dinner, but she came and sat at the table and started talking to us while she was eating, and uh, you know, my father-in-law, you know, he was just like, I didn't expect that. Well, she started just like prophetically, like talking into our dynamic, uh, like you're his son-in-law, and she didn't know anything about us. And, and then she started just declaring some stuff for our lives, both of our lives. Afterwards, we were just speechless, and she left. And Ron said, I think that was an angel. Like her eyes were really blue, and she had these brand new shoes on, but she was saying she was homeless. I don't know. But it, it changes your perspective. That, that stranger that is there maybe, you know, asking you for a meal. Could be an angel, you guys. I don't know. So this leads me to 2 Kings. If you're there, let's go to chapter 6. So the story is Elisha is a prophet of God in the Old Testament. And he's being used as a conduit of heaven to basically save his people. And so he's revealing to the king the king's the enemy's plans that, that he is making in the chamber. So, so the Lord is giving Elisha these words of knowledge on how this guy is going to attack the king. And so Elijah's telling the king. And so finally, this guy is like, who, who is reveal, who's the mole in the camp? And they're like, there's no mole. It's Elisha. He's a man of God. He's hearing from heaven in, in what you say in your inner chamber. So he's like, well, let's just go kill this guy. So they set out to kill the guy, and that's where we, uh, they, they set out to kill Elisha, and this is where we pick up the story. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots has surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You, you think about this story and, and you just, just think like in the servant's eyes, they were outnumbered. In Elisha's eyes, those that were coming against them weren't as you know, numbered as the ones are surrounding them. So I like to say this, when you feel surrounded by the enemy of your life, just know that God and his angels are surrounding the enemy that is trying to surround your life. Yeah, here's it. You want to hear a good news? Like theologically, right? There was demons are fallen angels. And, and, and we hear scriptures like, you know, from the book of Revelation where there, there was this falling of angels. Well, let's go there. Revelation chapter 12 kind of gives us this backstory of what's happening in this war that is all around us. It says, then war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil of, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. This, this is the reality that we're living in right now. It's happening, whether you want to believe it or not. There is a fight 
that you cannot run away from that is happening in our midst, in our lives, in our community, in our state, in our nation, in our world. This is a real thing. Now, another passage earlier in chapter 12, it gives us this idea that only a third of the stars fell, meaning that a third of the, the angels that were worshiping God decided to betray God and they fell with Satan in the earth, which is kind of good news because that means that angels outnumber demons two to one, all right? So next time you feel overwhelmed and something's demonic, just know that God is outpacing the demonic entity. So when you are feeling surrounded by your enemy, just know that God is surrounding the enemy that is surrounding you. I, I just, I don't know who that's for, but wear it, okay? Be encouraged by it. And we know just not only Revelation, but Daniel, who is a man of God, he's praying and and he has an angel come and visit him. And and the angel says, I would have been here earlier, but this demonic entity that is in charge of watching over the whole Persian area, he came and he, he tried to take me captive and I would have been here earlier, but Michael had to come and rescue me. So Daniel it's like praying and fasting for 21 days and this breakthrough happens for his life, which tells me sometimes prayer is spiritual warfare. Sometimes you don't get the answer to prayer on day one because you have to continue to pray through the spiritual warfare that is trying to prevent the breakthrough for happening for you. So, so one prayer is not gonna do it. Two prayers aren't, aren't, aren't gonna do it. Sometimes it takes 21 days of fervent prayer in order to move heaven to earth because of all the warfare that's going on between heaven and earth. And this is Daniel giving us this idea of what's happening. And then you have Jesus. And he's saying, hey guys, you really wanna know how to pray powerful powerful and effective prayers? It's found in this. And he gives them, you know, what we call the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, And then right there in the middle, It says to deliver us from the evil one. So in Jesus' model prayer, he says, don't neglect to pray through the spiritual warfare that's happening against your life. Because it's happening. That there's entities and dark principalities that are trying to get and invade your space. And that word deliver us in the Greek language means to break the chains, to loose the the bands and to snatch and to pluck us from the evil one. So Jesus is recognizing that sometimes you can get caught up in something and, and be totally unaware of it. So it's just to pray for that deliverance. If, if you feel shackled up, if you feel like you're chained up and, and you found your way there, you know, just you didn't even intend to, to do something, but it just found its way to you. The good news is you can pray for God to deliver you and he will do it. All right? I just want you to know that. You don't, you don't need to come up. You don't need to like necessarily have people lay hands and, and pray and, and have some deliverance. Sometimes those things are there. You need extra prayer. But you can pray right there. Lord, deliver us before the attack even affects me. And then this is why I believe in the New Testament, the most important chapter that we need to know about is Ephesians chapter 6. And that was the whole video. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10, look at it with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You you see what Paul is saying here, who, who writes to the church in Ephesus, he's saying, Gang, listen to me. Like, there are schemes that are being thrown your way, and you need to be aware. Instead of getting mad at a person, we need to start getting mad at the real enemy, who is this demonic entity that is trying to mess up God's church. We got to get mad and angry and put our fight and our energy towards that fight and quit fighting one another. And let me tell you about the devil's schemes. He doesn't have a thick playbook. How many love football? All right, go Sooners. All right, I'm a college football guy and we're having a, a okay season, not as good as Ohio State uh, or Michigan. That's gonna be a good game this week. But you know, I know a lot of coaches and one, one of my buddies is a 
a head coach of one of our local high school football teams, he said, Jim, for years, I've followed this model uh, when it comes to like our playbook. You run it until they stop it. In other words, if a play is being effective, you just keep running it until they figure out how to stop it. And I, I believe the enemy of our lives has the same kind of philosophy when it comes to his model to attack our life. And I, I believe you can narrow his playbook down to four categories. And I, they all start with D to make it easy for you to memorize. Because as I say some of these things, uh, uh, an event is going to come, an activity is going to come to your mind and go, oh, wait a minute. Was that, was, was that like a spiritual attack on my life? Maybe. But let me give you the four Ds. Number one is discouragement. Write that down. Now, discouragement is something that could be natural. It could also be spiritual. It could go both ways. Sometimes, chemically, our heads get off, and sometimes we can start kind of feeling weird inside and maybe depressed. That, that could be natural. But there's a spiritual element of discouragement. And, and here's how you know some kind of a discouragement is spiritual in nature. You go to bed. You're having a great day. It's an amazing day. You're just so pumped. You go to sleep. You wake up the next morning. Nothing's changed. You just have slept six to eight hours or whatever. And you wake up and you are just feeling super down. You're just feeling super discouraged. Maybe even you have like crazy demonic thoughts of like, I don't even think, you know, I want to live anymore. That is an indicator that there is spiritual warfare against your life because you have no good reason to feel discouraged. It just came out of the blue. Pray for your pastors on Monday because I don't know why, but maybe because we give ourselves so much on Sunday, a lot of times it's a, it's a thing within church culture that pastors wake up with Monday morning blues. And I think it's spiritual attacks. So pray for your pastors on Monday morning. But discouragement can come. The, the second D, write this down, is distraction. Distra it's, man, the, he loves this play. And man, he is having a heyday in our social media world right now because we are more distracted than we ever have been. And man, I hate Instagram reels. They are so addicting, you guys. The Instagram uh, texts have figured out how to capture our attention by giving us things that we like. And so I just go on Instagram for whatever reason, and then I just can't stop in these reels because, you know, they, they do a lot of sports and a lot of, you know, animals attacking people. That tells me a lot about me, right? This is like, these are two things I love, you know, sports and animals attacking people. But I, I just say that because, like, it's so like, oh, 10 minutes have went by. Have you ever just looked back in the day and go like, man, so much was wasted today. That's distraction. And you've got to be aware that maybe the distraction isn't social media. Maybe it's a job. He's trying to get you so distracted and overwhelmed that you're not paying attention to your family. He, he's going to try to distract you with sin. Some of you have never looked at sin as a distraction mechanism from the enemy. But it, as long as you're thinking about all of the sin that you are dealing with, you're not thinking about the ministry that God wants you doing. So it's distraction. And here's the third thing, division. Write that down. Division. He wants you getting in fights with your spouse. How many of you that are married here have ever had a moment where just it, you went from zero to 100 miles an hour, full-fledged, like maybe just yelling, screaming, and just like just five minutes before that was fine. It just like, you know, an argument over what we're going to have for dinner just broke out, and now the cops are coming. It's like it's weird stuff like that happens. Never happened to me. Not that, you know, extensive. But it has happened to more people than I can count, where it's just I don't even know how it erupted like this. But the enemy hates the marriage union, and he will stop at nothing short of making you guys go to fist city and hate each other because he's not just after you he's after your kiddos i have a word for you're, you're gathering this thursday some of you with family you haven't seen them in a while i had a word as i was praying as i was worshiping somebody here you're gonna you're gonna face something at the dinner table and it's gonna be there to distract you to or to divide you rather uh maybe it's gonna be a crazy uncle that is gonna talk about Trump or talk about Biden and it's just like you can feel the bait being put out there don't don't bite the bait 
Don't bite the bait. Talk Jesus. Talk love. When they want to talk about everything else, it's just the enemy. He's trying to divide your family. You can say, aha, the pastor gave us a word. I'm not going there. Let me tell you how Jesus has changed my life. I got baptized this year, you guys. I don't want to talk about Trump. I don't want to talk about Biden. I just want to talk about Jesus. Are you guys okay with that? Like, I mean, we can see revival in our families. But here's, here's the last one. Write this down. That's deception. Deception. Write that down. This is a huge play that the enemy has against our lives. He will deceive our minds. And we, we will believe a lie as truth. He will head fake us and make us believe a lie about ourselves, a lie about our families, a lie about our circumstances. He's really good at deceiving us. His, I, I would say his favorite play he loves is deception. So think about that. Discouragement, distraction, division, deception. That pretty much summarizes 2020 in one play right there. We had all four of those rolled out at once, and man, was it crazy. But I just want to encourage you. Maybe in just instead of dismissing it, maybe you need to engage with it and, and not engage with the person, but engage with the principalities and take it to prayer. I want to give you the ABCs of spiritual warfare in the next 10 minutes and then bring us back into worship because we have to end a spiritual warfare talk with worship because let me tell you something that I've, I've said for many, many years. Worship is your warfare. All right? Worship is your warfare. So number one, the ABCs of spiritual warfare, number one is the authority in Christ. Authority in Christ. Write that down. Authority in Christ. That the name of Jesus carries authority. That's why when I said the name of Jesus on the phone with this gal, she started erupting. Why? Because the enemy of this world, the enemy of our lives, hates the name of Jesus because all authority has been given to that name. Look with me at Mark chapter 1 in, in the paraphrased version again. It says, the crowd was awestruck and kept saying among themselves, what is this new teaching that comes with such, what is that word, church? Authority. With merely a word, he commands demons to come out and they obey him. Jesus had authority, but then check this out. In Matthew 28, he's leaving. And this is what he says. Jesus came and said to them, all authority. How much authority, church? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what you need to understand is when Jesus came to this world, he got the keys back. He got the keys to dad's house Get your keys out. If you have your keys, get your keys out. And I just want you to just like, just ring them for me. Just get your keys out. See, what he, what Jesus did is in the garden, the enemy deceived Adam and Eve, and he took the keys of authority from them. And Jesus came to this world, died on the cross, and resurrected from the grave to get our keys back to us. So now we have the keys, which is Jesus. And so we have the authority because the authority is in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. Are you tracking with me? So you don't have to be afraid of demons. You don't have to be afraid of darkness. You don't have to be afraid of evil, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Knuckle bump your neighbor and say, that's some good news. I'm preaching to the 930. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. He says, enemy occupied territory. He's a great author. That is what the world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. You're a sabotager. You're bringing heaven to earth. And you're, you're an enemy occupied territory. So there's positional authority and there's personal authority. And we all, because of the cross, we, we, have no, we, we have no say in the positional authority that Jesus has given all of our lives. But we do have a say in the personal authority. In other words, Ephesians 6 goes on and talks about the full armor of God. He says, put on the full armor of God. This is your uniform. This is how you walk in personal authority. You have positional authority, but do you have personal authority? Do you have your suit on? Are you covered in the authority of Jesus when you leave your house in the morning? Are you walking in that authority? I tell you, years ago I had a neighbor that was a part of our police department. And, 
you know, he was a motorcycle police officer. And so, I, you know, he did barbecues. We hung out all the time. Just a good dude. And so as I'm thinking about, you know, my, my neighbor a, a couple times, you know, I've come home. At the same time, he's coming home, but he got to take his bike home. So he would come home fully in uniform on his bike. And I knew it was my neighbor. I knew it was my bro. And every time he would get behind me in that uniform on that bike, I just had, you know, hand on 10 and 2. You know, I got to drive really. I'm doing the speed. I know it's my neighbor, but the uniform just speaks such authority that even though I know he won't give me a ticket, it just causes me to live differently. And when you walk around this world with your uniform on, demons are scared. They are fearful of who you are because of whose you are. You belong to Jesus, and the demons aren't afraid of you. They're afraid of the Jesus in you. But you got to put your uniform on. Look at your neighbor and say, get your uniform on. And this, honestly, baptism, I know you guys baptized 31 people. Can we give a shout of praise for 31 people being baptized two weeks ago in this church? At Atmosphere Church, where we are, we had, this year alone, we've had 250 people baptized in Jesus' name. And let, let me tell you something about baptisms. It is your first declaration of war to the enemy because you are being dunked into a new identity. You are now being clothed in Christ. And so baptism becomes that declaration of war. So get your suit on, suit up. Number two is battle buddies. I'm looking at time, battle buddies. This is so important for you to understand. Some of you, I mean, don't you just love Pastor Russell and Annette? I love those guys. But let me tell you something, church. He better not be your only friend of this church. Number one, you're overwhelming him, all right? He's like, he can only be a friend to so many people. But number two, it's not healthy for you because he's not always available. So it's, it's key to get some other soldiers mounting up with you and going to battle with you. That's why I call them battle buddies. And, you know, you watch the nature shows. It's the zebra that's by himself that always gets eaten by the lions, the herd, it keeps them protected. And you need a herd in your life in order to help protect you. The, the diagram I've been using for years here at this church, some of you remember me doing this diagram. Uh, I call it the fantastic four, that we all need four people in our life that are gonna surround our life. And, and the best way to model this is you find somebody that's older, more mature in their faith than you are, and then find some, somebody that's younger and less mature than you are, and they get two people on each side of you that are about the same place that you are spiritually so that, man, you're texting each other during the day, you're praying for each other during the week. I mean, you got each other, right? So guess what happens? When the enemy tries to come and get you, he's got to go through somebody to get to you. Right now, because your only friend is the pastor, Pastor Jerry, Pastor Russell, or one of our staff, like he's, he's able to get to you quick. You got to find some battle buddies to help insulate you against the attacks and the strategies of the evil one against your life. And number three is the C, and that's closed gates. We got to close some gates in your life. It's not too difficult for demons to get you because, man, they have an all-access pass right now to your life. You're bringing them in, and you're not even aware of it. And, and there's, there's a closing of the gate that needs to happen so that you stop giving the enemy access to your life. What are some of the ways he comes in? He comes in through alcohol. I mean, hello, it's right on the thing. Spirits. Have you ever thought about that? Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to drink. But excessive drinking, getting drunk, you know, you don't make good decisions. Every pastor that I've heard that has fallen into some kind of immorality, you trace it back and it comes down to alcohol. You got to be careful. Drugs, it's another form of sorcery. Sex outside of marriage, including pornography. Uh, other things like Ouija boards, seances. All these things are, are portals for darkness to have access to your life. And in the book of Nehemiah, they couldn't, they couldn't live in peace because the enemies kept coming in and invading them. It's time to rebuild the walls and restore the gates of your life. How are you going to do that? Through holiness. He's, you're going to do that through holiness. And um, I'm just convinced we're forfeiting way more ground than is being stolen from us. And, and what we have to do is we have to say, man, I, I've got I've to like say no to some stuff because 
Maybe it's not killing me, but it's allowing stuff into my life. And, and this is a word for some. You have little kids. Your decisions impact them. The spirits that you potentially are bringing into your home are impacting your children. And they're struggling. You may not even be aware of it. They're spirits that are messing with you, and they're ultimately going to mess with your kids. So that's the ABC of spiritual warfare. I'm going to land this thing. Revelation 12, 11, let's go back there. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How did they overcome? The blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. Blood of the lamb, which is Jesus. He already did that. You can't change that. It's done. So that, check that box. The other one is the word of your testimony. When, when I hear that, I, I know we all think of like, you know, when, when I found Jesus, you know, he took me out of this space that I was in. But the, the testimony isn't just your salvation testimony. The testimony is an ongoing testimony of the ways that God is moving in your lives. And he wants to move not just once. He wants to move weekly. He wants to move daily. And the more testimony of ways that God is activating you and putting you into miracle stories of other people, guess what? You're going to be an overcomer. Some of you, the key to changing the narrative on your life, instead of being overcome by sin, you start having to be an overcomer in your testimony. You start stepping out more and be more bold in your faith and start doing those little promptings of God saying, hey, go pray for her. Go talk with him. Go, go minister to that group of people. And you're going to see breakthrough happen for your life. Because here's what I want to end with. The best defense for you is a good offense, my friend. Go on the offense. Look at your neighbor and say, go on the offense. Go on the offense. And I like this. Be the kind of Christian that when you wake up, all the demons yell, oh, blank, he or she is up again. That's, that's what God wants for your life. Don't you want to kind of live that kind of a lifestyle? And all the power that you will ever need to live on the offense has been already given to you through the Spirit of God living in you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. Do you really believe that? Then what are we doing with it? Some of you are praying for a breakthrough, a miracle for your health. Why would God want to just extend the days that you have on earth? What are you going to do with those days? You know, do, do some Netflix binging. Like, oh, I'm going to preserve my day so I can watch the new episode of the, my favorite show. No, God will preserve the days of the people that are making a difference for his kingdom. And so there is a call of God to go on the offense. Go make a difference in this world because the keys to changing the narrative of not just your story, but everybody's story that's connected with you is the authority of Jesus that lives in you. Every demon of hell bows down and is dreading the name of Jesus. And you have it, my friend. So let's live victoriously. One last thing. You know, in World War II, most experts believe the war ended on June 6, 1944. It was called D-Day. It was when America and our allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. So the war was pretty much over, but it wasn't declared victory until May 8th, 1945. It was known as V-Day or the, the Victory in Europe Day. So almost a whole year went by between the time that the war was over and when the victory was celebrated. I, I want to tell you, church, we are living between D-Day and V-Day right now. D-Day happened the moment that Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected on the third day. That was, that was D-Day for the demons. But we're living in this in-between because guess what? V-Day is still coming. V-Day is coming when Jesus is coming back on a white horse with a big old tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah, Jesus has a tattoo. Read it, Revelation 19. And he's coming back. And he's going to set up his kingdom once and for all. In the meantime, my friend, be that sabotager. Bring the good. Bring the light. Bring the love. And let's make a difference for the kingdom 
of God. Father, in this moment, Lord, I know not everybody in this room has surrendered their life to you, Jesus. And maybe demons of hell are just having a heyday. Maybe some people here are chained up and shackled up in all kinds of addiction and all kinds of sin. And today, God, you want to set them free. The cross has made a declaration that we don't have to live chained up anymore. That because of the cross, Lord, we can live in freedom. And so if anybody here, if you are still shackled up, if you're still chained up, God wants to set you free today. It's about you surrendering to him today. Give your life to Jesus. And if you're ready to make that decision, just right where you're sitting, just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for resurrecting for me. Fill me with your spirit, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. And I thank you for the way you want to use me to make a difference in this world. Let me be that light. Let me be that good. Let me be that love for a world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.